welcome to Inside the Barrel podcast uh, with John and I at the, the helm. We're kind of going behind the scenes on what it what it's like to work as a consultant uh, in, at CAST and in specifically in the ServiceNow space. Um, today's topic, we're going to talk about the actual hackathon that, that happened last week and how tough it was for me to try to do it. <laughs> Um, and you know, we're just kind of going to talk about specifically why you should join this hackathon. Um, you know, what you're going to get out of it. How would you, you know, get, um, get started on the right foot. Um, and you know, what you, what you potentially can, can learn from it. So Um. we also have me at the helm of this live streaming. So we're hoping that (laughs) uh, my transitions will go really well. We're, we're f- no script yeah. and n- don't even know how to run the, the hardware. <laughs> we, we think it's working. Um, so yeah, if you want to screen share, John, we'll kind of, we'll start with like the yeah. title board yeah. and we'll, okay. well, let's start with the community hackathon post that talks about the form Perfect. around it. All right. There. So here's the, uh, the community post. Um, Shout out to Andrew Barnes for having some humor. Yeah, in so his if you post. Don't know, every every <laughs> <laughs> every year at Knowledge Twenty Twenty One, there's this thing called CreatorCon, and CreatorCon is this opportunity for you know developers, admins, product people to kind of get together and build really cool stuff. There isn't really a problem statement for it. It's really like you get an instance essentially, and they say, you know, don't bring in any code, but you're welcome to go and, you know, you know, try to build something really awesome. And at the end of the 24 hour hackathon, uh, you essentially submit like a little prompt, like a little video explaining it, describing your business problem, um, describing, you know, what's the competitive landscape, um, not as super important, like in this in this hackathon, I didn't really focus on something competitive. I found I wanted to do something fun, um, but this is kind of you know a little bit about it. Um, to get signed to get started, at least you know going forward next year, there's really just a link you sign up for a few days beforehand. Uh, you register for knowledge; it's free, or at least this one was free, um, and you uh, like click a few links to join to create a team or go solo or join a team. Um, kind of once, once you've decided that you're going to join the hackathon, you know, I always like to recommend going in it with a little bit of planning, um, specifically if you want to know what you want to build. Um, so like, these are some of the prizes that, you know, John's kind of reading through, like you could win an Oculus, which sounds dope. I don't think I'm going to win it. Um, but you can (laughs) get some headphones. Ooh, could you imagine your zoom meetings with AR. AR. Yeah, would... <laughs> they should just send me one anyways now because I'm promoting Ooh, this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, I should get one too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then we could just be walking all around. Whoa. You just start getting sponsorship, man. Like that's that's what we got. We got to work on that. Um, yeah. So <laughs> T- today's broadcast brought to you brought to you by Cask. Yeah. They are sponsoring us. <laughs> And I'm all chickened out today because I I have chickens this year. So, yeah. Yeah. So I've gone hardcore into chickens. So, so let's say I expect mail, you know, first class delivery, some chicken eggs. That would be great. For Meg, yeah, our eggs. Well, they're not that old yet. They're getting there. Yeah. But uh, probably a few more. I don't know. When do they start laying? (laughs) I know nothing about chickens. (laughs) I just have some. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, right. Yeah. So, so let's say going back to this, like, let's say you signed up for this hackathon. You're super excited. You have a business problem. Um, there's a couple different routes you can go. Um, you could create a visual task board in a PDI to kind of start tracking some of like your work. Or what I just did, because we don't have access to the instance be- until before, is create a Trello board. So essentially, this is an example, very basic Trello board. Um, and normally,
normally I would say if you were going to build something for like a client, you would write user stories. Um, but since uh, the people involved in this hackathon were just myself and a few other engineers, we, we, we kind of knew at a high level what the problem was. And we just wanted to dish out like who's going to do work in what part of the application. So in this case, like our application is very you know basic. We built some data policies. We built a few tables. Um, we built some REST messages. We built some flows, and we created like a workspace experience and UI builder. So that's kind of like at a high level. Have some plan like this. It's good to split out your stories, especially if you're planning on hacking them all together in such a way that they don't overlap with another person. So if one person's working on this table, don't have two people working on that table just because update sets and, you know, conflicts are just going to kind of happen. Yes. Um, and so we kind of split them out per application. And then if you like click on, you know, create a table to store data, for example, um, there's a bunch of checklists in there that essentially, you know, you know, help somebody, you know, work on something. So. You know, here's an example, just very basic checklists that you don't have to spend a lot of time because you want, and, and your hackathon time is very precious and you want as much time, you know, building the thing. Right. I was going to ask you what, there's a time limit on how long you have to uh, build your application, correct? Yeah. So you have to be really strategic about, you know, what you're actually working on. So that's why, you know, having some sort of plan beforehand on a hackathon, if you have the potential to do so is really is really helpful so i built this like a day before the hackathon just jotting my notes down and this changed over time even during yeah. the hackathon we were going through oh this doesn't work like i didn't plan out every you know nook and cranny um i just try to get us you know started <laughs> <laughs> right yeah sometimes you can't plan it all out ahead of time yeah so we'll kind of talk a little bit about my what, what i did at the hackathon um if you want to go over to that tab and and this isn't really a shout out or anything. It's just kind of, I'm going to have John kind of walk through some of the, the things that we built in it. Um, so essentially what I wanted to, uh, to work on was something in the cryptocurrency space. Um, for those that don't know, digital currencies, um, they're essentially trying to change the landscape of how we think about money and how we essentially can, un, uh, we can um, help people bank that, you know, are in third world countries or, or sending money to family and friends in eminence. Um, and if you don't know, about 2 billion people don't have bank accounts. And But of those 2 billion people, like 75% of them have cell phones. And so essentially what um, you know the cryptocurrency or digital currency space is trying to do is you know give those people bank accounts. Um, and so in, in this hackathon, we chose Nano as a uh, potential one we wanted to do something with. And the reason for that is there's no fees when you send money. There's this you know, altruistic view of, of digital currency where there is no um, you know, transaction fee when you send it. So it's really great for testing on projects because if I send you one nano, you receive one nano. So I don't lose anything out of that. Whereas there are some other ones like Bitcoin and, and Ethereum that you have to pay a fee to use the, the network. Um, and so we, won't, we, we just wanted to do something simple for this, this PFC. And specifically what we built was what they call in the, the digital currency space a, a faucet. And faucets um, essentially are, imagine you um, have a kid and you wanna explain what the US dollar is and you wanna give them you know, an example of the US dollar. Normally, you go into your wallet, you take out a dollar, and you hand it to them. You say, hey, here's, here's money. Go spend it as, as you want. Um, in, in, the, in the digital currency space, you, you need to know somebody that has it in order to receive it. And so, like, faucets <laughs> are examples of, you know, donations, essentially. Like, you can come here, you enter in your, your wallet address, which is just like your bank account, and you click receive, and if there's anything in the balance, um, and apparently we got drained, so there's nothing in our balance, um, uh, you, uh, mm. you get you receive some uh, some nano, and um, so so that's kind of at a high level what we were trying to do. We wanted to see if we can use ServiceNow as this kind of front end experience to have a faucet where you can enter in an address, 
click receive and it sends you now. Um, so if we want to go into the back end, just, just at a high level, what some of the things that we did. Um, oh, and the other thing we wanted to do with this and, and why we wanted to differentiate and use ServiceNow is um, we wanted to incentivize it. So there's a lot of things you could do on like the network. Like imagine like you know how your bank account says go paperless, right? And they will they'll reduce a fee for you. So we wanted to use this this faucet as a way to say, hey, if you do these things, like what in this in this case, like change your rep or sign up, right? Like you will get extra mana. So it essentially is trying to gamify, you know, saying, hey, if you do these things that are good for you and good for the network. We'll keep sending you mana, um, and so like ServiceNow is a great platform for that because it allows you to sort emails really easily. It allows you to send emails. It allows you to use workflows yeah. in order to, to check things. It allows you to store data. So if on the filter navigator, if you click on you know Nano, um, sorry, type in Nano, you'll notice that we created a few um, a, a few different tables. Um, one so incentive tasks. Oh, and by the way, don't click on NanoBank because we didn't encrypt anything. So don't click on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Not that there's any money in there. But, Woo! Uh, so yeah. secure. So, secure. Yeah. Uh, so these are what I was talking about with like these incentive tasks. Like if you change your account rep, you know, we'll send you 12.5 nano, right? And oh. here, here's example. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure that showed your bank account or no, the that's nano account. account. That, that's, that's Oh yeah, that's okay. It didn't show the. It's a reference. It didn't show the actual like seed or the password. Oh okay. So, <laughs> I got a little nervous when I saw that. I was like, yeah. oh wait, whoops. Um, but yeah, so here's an idea. If, you know, if you click on transactions, for example, we built a table. You know, around, um, you know, a payout. You know, a payout date. Um, your incentive. And so we were essentially building a few different tables. Nano address, for example, on the left hand side is um, it stores if you, you know, cl uh, select a nano address um, or if you enter in it on the front end, you know, we'll store it. Uh, you could click on that one. That's totally fine. And notice like when you sign up, we're storing a bunch of data um, about you so that we can, you know, do things like check your account rep, right? And, and, and see if those change or see if your balance changes, right? So, you know, those are, those are examples where like, you know, we're storing this data so that in the future we could, you know, incentivize people to, to, to continue on. Um, and so that's kind of at a, um, some of the, the base tables. Let's go into a REST message. Um, so another cool thing we did is uh, type in REST message is essentially use the APIs that exist in order that are free for people to use um, to, to validate things. So if you click on get account uh, rep or get account balance, either one of those, yeah. And then you click the test button here. So essentially we um, can run these tests that um, will go out to the network and go and check some things. It's like saying like, hey, I wanna check, you know, what, who do I bank with, right, in this case? And so you pass an address and we go and find it. Um, what's really cool, so one key thing about hackathons is you always wanna focus on the thing that you're trying to build, right? We didn't want to go and build a whole endpoint like this mynano.ninja endpoint to, to go and actually validate the blockchain. Like that's not something that you have time to do in, in a hackathon. So one thing you do wanna make sure is when you do jump into a hackathon, know what like things are available for you to do it, right? Like we didn't wanna build a CAPTCHA on our front end. So we go and find the community, who's done a CAPTCHA and you know put that in, right? Like those are things that you kinda of wanna think about of who are your external parties that you wanna make sure work in order for you to be successful. Um, yeah, and, and I, I want to interject one thing here when it comes to REST messages, and I know you probably didn't spend time doing this because, again, like you said, you only have so much time and you've got to focus on the app itself. You don't want to do external things, but outside of this, like in your normal day-to-day, -day, if you're building REST messages, I'm going to shout out to an app that I use uh, regularly is Postman um, to to build and test your 
really to make sure you can get to your endpoint, you can pass it what you want and you get the response back that you want to use. I'll, I'll use it to, cause I had to build just the other week, I had to build a, a simple stock ticker for a company. Um, and so I, I used Postman to do all the, the investigative work, right? To make sure I could call it this way, I get a response back. And then I take that and I, I use it in, um, you know, when I, when you build out the, uh, the actual message here, you can set, you know, that's what I use <laughs> as a pro tip. <laughs> yeah, totally. Like I, I do find Postman is a lot easier to start. I think you just want to yeah. make sure that it works in a rest message because there are a little subtle differences between Postman. So like as, as quickly as you can move it into like a rest message or a rest step, if you're using flow designer, the better, but like, I agree, mm -hmm. like getting started Postman, super awesome, um, to, to get going. Yeah. And, and another, another pro tip here is this preview script usage. Mm. Oh my gosh. They just, they write it for you. <laughs> <laughs> Once it works, you come in here, copy, paste, done. <laughs> yeah totally it's like so nice this is a server side script like it this is great yeah yep yeah. the only thing they don't that's do great. is you need to just to let people know is when you get that var response body you need to parse it right so yes just, right as a as an fyi and there's actually a script include on here so let's kind of let's let's transition to that so if we go to script include, yeah yeah we can kind of show an example of how we do that If I update it, yeah. Which one would you like? Fine. Yeah, no, address is fine. Okay. Um, so if we scroll down, oh, I think it's actually no, we're going to want to use. Sorry. Oh, okay. We had an engineer really do a good job at factoring this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like here's an example when we talked about that code is already there. Like, you know, it's it's awesome that like you essentially get this code and notice how we do a little check on line 32 to 36 where we're saying you know if we did get a good response right then we want to parse the result um yeah and you know underneath it on line 42 we're doing stuff with that result right we we know what we're getting we're, we're doing some things and um you know that's kind of an example of you know how you can use this and so wherever you're calling the script include um, and triggering this uh, this request, then it essentially will allow you to, um, to, to manipulate or utilize that data. So this is how yeah. you, an example of how you use rest, um, rest messages and script include, and then just you know, calling you know, the rest message. Um, we, can, we can jump into an example of how you do that in Flow Designer. It's a little bit different. Um, but normally I tell people when they get started with REST, like start with REST messages, start with a script include, and like make sure that works. Because at the end of the day, you could always use like some scheduled job or some event to trigger that if like you're not comfortable in Flow Designer yet. Um, yeah, I, uh, let's see, a couple years ago, I had a project come through that was a stateless, um, it was to show employees their cbus you know their stock stuff and they didn't want anything stored in the system because you know obviously they don't want anyone besides your set you know only you can see your information and <clears throat> it got architected out as a completely uh rest application and that's exactly how i did it, is i i built um the the rest messages and then so when you load the the web page it, it runs and calls it right then and there and uh nothing gets saved anywhere the calculations are all done right then so every time you load it you get new calculations because things may have changed um but yeah it's it's really fun to do those sort of like those kind of projects are fun to me because it's like something you don't normally do ever it was it was just an interesting use case for rest messages above and beyond just trying to import data into the system because we weren't saving it anywhere it was just real time uh stateless yeah stateless is really cool um especially if you have like a 
a table constraint on your licensing, like, and you need to <laughs> <laughs> essentially just collect data, do something with it, and then like move on. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And, and pro pro tip: watch out for <laughs> your clients' licensing when <laughs> needing to build tables. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> that can really get problematic. <laughs> times like in the, the worst part is like they won't they'll say yeah sure like you know create a table and it, it's not until like a year later when they renew the licensing do the service now comes <laughs> like what, what's yeah. going on here you need to reconcile this and it's right ordeal. so you, you get real creative about where you start placing data you know um i think a, a common one for us is favorites you know, or some sort of user preference, you know, so I want to hide show different quick links, right? Mm -hmm. Where do I store all this user preference information? And I think currently the, the hotness right now is like, I, I end up doing it as a JSON object or JSON string mm -hmm. on, you know, either the user account or the HR profile, depending on where it's from. And so now, so, cause I used to, you know, before there was the table, uh, the table licensing issue, I would just build out, you know, tables to store all this stuff. But now it's like, I got to be super creative <laughs> where I hide it and, and call it. We, sh we showed in our, uh, in, on that nano address table, we showed using a name value pair. So if you went to that, um, uh, nano reserved address. Just click on the second one, probably. Yeah. Like, here's an example of us storing REST data as name value pairs. So if you right click mm -hmm. on that REST data and show that dictionary, um, you know, rather than us, you know, creating a field for each one of those, we created a name value pair, right? And when you have a name value pair, you can, I mean, just pretty much pass in a, a name and a value and just just keep going so um so that's always like a fun choice for a given field and if you need to add more data you press the plus button and you get a new value <laughs> and it just keeps going um, so that's definitely yeah a that's tip. Um, not that is a pro not, tip for it's sure it's not easy to report on this data and it's not easy to obviously view, but it is very good to store and utilize <laughs> if you if it's like a, a transition kind of thing. That's how that's what we yeah. Like. Mm -hmm. Um cool. Let's let's kinda hop into flow and talk a little bit about some of the cool things we did in flow designer. Um, now I don't use flow designer very often, so you're gonna have to really walk me through this. Yeah, yeah, click the first link up top. <laughs> it should open in a new tab that one okay um, yeah it it's really cool like as you start using flow designer more and more you learn tips and tricks which are really nice um so so let's just take a step to talk about what you can do in flow um so up top on those header bars there's flows subflows and actions Right, those are kind mm -hmm. of the main three one. Executions are where you test or see your results of things, and connections okay. are a way to kind of help you connect to REST APIs or aliases, connection aliases. So the main three ones are flows, subflows, and actions. And the hardest thing that I find is where do you start? Do you start with a flow? Do you start <laughs> with a subflow? Do you start with an action? And um, you know, my rule of thumb is Think about it at the action level. Like, what is the thing that you actually need to do? So if you click on actions, for example, if you think of, you know, things as functions, right, or things as small, like you want your actions to be very specific to what you're trying to do, right? Your actions are, you know, validate wallet address, get account balance, like, like add rest data, right? You know, these are very specific things. And like, if you click on, you know, let's say validate, uh, wallet address right like an action is you have some sort of inputs and then you run something so you know this is a hackathon so we're trying to go really quick right and so in this case it's just one script step that um, essentially just calls our script include but you, if you click the plus button between inputs and outputs just to show there's you know really cool things you can do out of the box rather than just scripting 
Um, it'll take a few seconds to load probably. But like you can do things in ServiceNow, like let's say you had an action where you needed to create a task, wait for something, look up something. Like these are examples of out of the box ones that you could use. Um, you know, if you wanted to say you had some complex approval thing where like you wanted to look up something, create a task and ask for an approval and you had to constantly be doing that, like you could create that into a custom action and then utilize that action. Um, so that's kind of where I normally start. I'm like, does it fit in an action? Is it singular? Is it, you know, the thing that uh, I need to do? And where the caveat there is the action may already exist in ServiceNow. So like what you don't want to do <laughs> is just rebuild like an action that look up records because ServiceNow provides mm -hmm. spokes and, um, and actions on those spokes in order to do that. So most of these, as you can see, that are out of the box, there's actually already an action that you can just throw into a flow or subflow. Um, but these are some really cool other ones that you can do. Um, to... So did you say, and maybe I missed it, do you consider actions to be singular activities or like how do you gauge your action, I guess? Yeah, actions are... Um, are singular activities that doesn't have flow logic, doesn't have logic in it. Like what, what I mean by that is I don't want to have to update a record, then check if the record does exist and then do something. So actions are like, I need to do these four things every single time without any logic related to those. Like that's a singular action. Um, but like, let's say you needed to do an approval process and then you needed to check if it was approved and then go and do something that's not an action like that's a that's a subflow or a flow does that does that help clarify john maybe <laughs> yeah um, that's okay um so I, I always try to apply all these platform things in my daily scripting life right and so you know for me um i'm trying to think if it matches you know down to the like the function level you know I'll, I'll build a function to do something and sometimes i can get pretty singular with that like the function does one thing yeah that's it i don't want it to do anything else i just want it to do this one thing in fact just yesterday i ran to a couple places where i had to make a determination between an insert or an update mm -hmm. and instead of and, and instead of trying to wrap that all up into one function i just said okay First, check to see if there's a record. If there's no record, then run the update. If there isn't a record, then run the, the insert function. So I broke it down into very singular steps. And I mean, you could just do a call that is new record, right? And that would tell you if it's a, a new record or an update. But um, you know, that's a big bit for you. Um, <laughs> you. So like an example is, is if you think about this action that we created, that's called validate wallet address. All this is doing is you, if you look at the input on the right side of the input variables, we're taking in a wall address um, all the way on the right. Yeah, the, the data pills on the right. I'm like using my hand, like thinking. Oh, that. on this so right. My other right. Yeah. Other right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's input, like we're taking in a wall address. And if you scroll down to the bottom where the output is, is we're just checking if it exists, right? Like that's essentially what this action, singular action is doing, because then we have other things that validate or do some logic around if it exists do this if it doesn't exist do that right so so that's kind of what i mean by it's like singular it's really trying to do one thing um if like let's say you had a a, a request catalog flow that or multiple request catalog flows that always create a task always ask for an approval and always update a record like those are those are a singular action I would call in this case that like you you pass in some data and it does those three things and then it outputs some data and like that's a reusable thing that you can now use multiple places because without that all of your flows would have to do those three things constantly right so you if you needed to change that in one place you have to change it in five places right uh, if you think of your catalog right. elements um, so think of them as reusable things like reusable functions that do very limited things in each one. Um, so let's let's go back to that home button on the, the top left, yeah. And let's go into subflows, we'll talk about subflows. Um, 
And so subflows, and we could click on the second one, check account rep ask. Uh, subflows are very similar to, to, to flows, um, except flows use are based off of triggers. So like a trigger being what time of day it is, if something happens in the system, like an event or a catalog gets created, like some of something happens and triggers it. Subflows are just flows, except you, you decide when you call them, like you pass in some data, some inputs that have some outputs, right? So that's the biggest thing about subflows. Normally, when in doubt, create a subflow, not a flow, because every time you create a flow, you can always call a subflow in your flow. But sub, but when going from a flow and you started and you built a complex flow, it's really hard to go from a flow to a subflow. So subflows, again, are reusable um, flows that you can use in your code, and we'll show an example of that. And um, and essentially they take inputs and make outputs. So in this case, we have this, this subflow that takes in a nano address and this bank account, and we'll explain why the bank account, and we just output if it completed or not. And so if you scroll down, notice that when I was talking about actions, right? So we have two, we have one action up top that we created, right? This validate um, address. So if you click on that, it will, uh, it'll show you that it inputs like the wallet address, right? And then action number two, where it says look up transaction record, this is actually an out of the box one by service now. And so if you click on it, it should open up the requirements that you need, right? So this is an example of how you would use it. Like notice the action there is look up record, you're asking what table it's on, what are the conditions, and then some information on like don't fail if there if it doesn't exist and if, if multiple records are found, right? Only return the first. So like this is you know an out of the box why you don't have to recreate this as a custom action they provide this one for you, and this one in Quebec is really cool because of this don't fail on error, because a lot of the times you normally have to uh, pre Quebec if your flow failed because you couldn't find a record it would it would stop the entire flow so it would it would oh boy you, it, it would <laughs> but now with this don't <laughs> fail on error um, it essentially outputs some. Uh, uh, a status for you, which is great because we decided to use that in this case, right? So if you scroll down is when we start getting into our first logic. So we check to say, hey, if action two is an error, so they didn't find an issue and it is a valid address, go do something, you know, check if the user has changed it. If they have changed it, then, you know, go create an, a transaction record go add some rest data and then go send them some nano, right? So like that's kind of an example of a subflow that now we can then call from different places. We can have different flows that want to call this one um, and, and continuously use this. So that's an example of a subflow. Notice there's logic in here that's using data from a previous step, right? So that's kind of the difference between actions, right? And, and subflows. Does that, does that kind of help John? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, so then let's talk about flows. Let's see. Uh, let's see if we open up one of those flows. Um, Which one? Let's do the first one, check incentive task. So met before we were looking at a, a subflow that just took inputs and outputs, um, us flows themselves don't, right? So if you look up top, there's a trigger. And so this is triggering daily at, you know, uh, at, at midnight essentially. And if you click on that trigger, I just want to show a couple other triggers. If you change the trigger to be from daily, just, just to kind of give you guys an idea is you can have a trigger that receives a rest um, call, right? You, you can have a trigger that's if a record is created or updated, you can have a record that is a trigger that is, you know, based on a service catalog Ooh. being filled, an inbound email coming in, yeah. an SLA being triggered. Um, so that those are kind of some of the triggers that you do. And we could have just taken this task and did everything we did in the subflow underneath it, right? So rather than building a subflow, notice um, this dynamic flow, if you see the nano, ta nano faucet task, that's calling our subflow. Um, and we could have just built that entire thing here, 
But if we ever wanted to reuse that task, maybe in a different flow, then essentially we'd have to continuously build it over and over again. Yeah. Um, so to me, it's always the rule of two, right? <laughs> if I have to write it twice, it's going into a function so I can call it again because I uh, two times is too many. It's one time. So one time. The, the difference, though, in your rule of two is really good is you may not know how this is going to be used in the future. And it's a lot harder to go from a flow to a subflow versus just calling something in a subflow. So my rule of one works here where I just create a <laughs> subflow first and then, and then, you know, put it in a flow, right? Like sure. Even if this yeah. just said a trigger of daily and then just called the subflow. Like, I think that's like, okay to see. Um, so the other cool thing I want to talk about is performance in Flow Designer. Um, and there's a reason why there is this thing called dynamic flow here. Um, if you click on the plus button all, all the way on the bottom, I just want to show this, but this dip, one, and then you click subflow. You should be, and then on the default, there should be the check nano on the right hand side. The, oh, oh, sorry, on the second pane of this. Oh, yeah. so you right just here? click on one of those. Yeah, so this is essentially how you call subflows. It looks something like this. Now, the the thing you have to be careful for when it comes to performance is um, Flow Designer puts everything in memory. So all of the records that you're collecting, um, it, like let's say you make a call to, to, to pull 50,000 records and then manipulate those 50,000 records, that's being stored in a single thread in memory. And so as you can guess, that can get really, really, really big and it can't yeah. continue on until the first thing is done. And so therefore your, your, your flow may just be massive memory hog. And so um, subflows don't solve that problem because that's still run in the same thread as the flow. But what does solve it is dynamic flows. Um, so essentially what we did, if you click on dynamic flow, it looks almost identical to that, the, those, the things that you're looking at there, but it's done in what it's called a dynamic flow. And dynamic flows are really great because it actually calls this, that subflow in a different thread and then can, and, and allows you to continue on. So if you're ever running into a performance thing, um, you can always take a subflow or to and move it to a dynamic flow. It's not really hard, um, but it, you essentially just you know call this um, this this flow logic. So that's just something to keep in mind if you want to be very performant. You essentially call your subflows in dynamic flows, um, and this is really good. This is really critical in this case because we're doing a for loop on you know uh, an unknown amount of records essentially that we could have and so we want to be able to throw off into different progress workers and different threads in, in service now to essentially you know run this subflow um, so that's kind of a little bit about you know dynamic flows thoughts on that nice now? well you know performance is always <laughs> a, a big thing and coming off of projects where you know on the portal side, anyways, when you're working with hundreds of thousands of records, mm -hmm. you know, it's it it always makes for much better experience when you can make them performant. You know, your your queries and your usage of that. So it's neat to see that they have given us a pathway to keep these things performant. Because the moment you 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 mentioned that, I, I thought back to some earlier days on the platform when I was doing um, inbound email actions and I had <clears throat> another group dump out like 10 or 15,000 emails at, at one time that came through ServiceNow. And, you know, everyone starts, you start getting the emails. Well, uh, ServiceNow is being real slow. It's not responding. And you go in there and look at your diagnostic page and you see red <laughs> and you're like, what just happened? Well, someone dumped in a ton of emails that it's now got to process through. Mm -hmm. And we had a pretty squirrely, just giant nightmare mm -hmm. um, inbound action happening. You know, I mean, it was looking at everything and doing certain different things and it had multiple different spawns and all, it was just a mess. It was not pretty, but you know, 
being able, you know, if there was, if there had been a mechanism like this back then, you know, that could have really solved some of those problems. And I think made it, uh, it would have improved the performance when emails come through or you have unknowns happen, like another group spawn thousands of emails and, you know, they hit the ser the service now instance all at once. Right. Yeah, sure would have been think, helpful. <laughs> and this hasn't been around the whole time, so I mean, service. No, we're like, talking. What are we talking? Uh, um, I want to say like 2014, somewhere around there, 2015, way back, way well, back I mean, in the I, day. I started on started using Flow Designer in New York, and this Dynamic Flow wasn't there, right? So yeah, yeah. Um, so Dynamic Flow came out in Paris, and it is it is like super awesome, and it's just you know it's one of those things that like. I don't know of a use case on why we wouldn't use dynamic flow in every use case. Like I, right. I, I just think of like, I don't want it all in one thread. I'd rather <laughs> memory and have it in a different thread. Um, well, yeah. So, I mean, unless you have an absolute knowledge of what you're going to hit or what's going to come through it, maybe, but if, if it's anything like what normal, you know, what you normally run through, you have no, it's, it's an nth number or an X number of items you really don't know, and so you you can't account for the performance hit that you're gonna take if you end up somehow with you know thousands, hundreds of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of records. You just have no idea. So yeah, it totally makes sense to use the dynamic, no matter almost 100% of the time. Yeah, yeah, and there is like it, it does make checking what happens. Like if you go on executions here, just to kind of talk about what it looks like oh no no uh you could do it from a flow from a flow itself you could check executions, oh, okay. which is kind of cool so up top right uh, top right yeah. oh right here like let's click on one that's completed so you'll you'll kind of notice here that if you click on the dynamic flow you could do yep you'll you'll notice that we're able to see some information here um if there, there are cases, and I think the reason for this is because I'm waiting for it to actually complete, knowing that it's there. But if you don't wait for it to complete, like you may not get to see this data, right? So the, and so like there are some pros and cons of like debugging things are harder in dynamic flow. So maybe you start in mm. flow and then you just move it into a dynamic flow very easily afterwards. Sure. Um, sure. But like, yeah, like I think it's like dynamic flow being added is like a super huge win for, for flow designer. And yeah, so that, that's kind of like a summary of some of the things that we, we built. I, I would love to show the UI builder stuff, but we ran into an issue with UI builder. So we switched over to portal again, a hack. <laughs> hmm, that, that sounds familiar. Yeah, it sounds so familiar. <laughs> this time, like we were prepared. It was, it was actually a bug on service now. I have a video uh, of it. Right? And, <laughs> but I am excited now to, to come back to that, 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 episode i think we can um we can start using ui builder I, I know a lot more about it now um which makes me feel more confident in in uh, potentially building something um, yeah we totally should we should revisit that one um but yeah so i mean this is kind of I, I feel like it's turned into a flow designer kind of you know walk through which is really cool um yeah you know, well you know it's it's nice to have the um you know, the work around it, a dry walkthrough with nothing mm -hmm. to put it in context is difficult. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like you can't just go in and be like, oh, this is Flow Designer, this and this and this. It's nice to have, you know, an app that you have built in it so you can use that as the context to explain as you walk through. And I, and I think that's really helpful um, for those who may be new at Flow Designer, like me or, you know, may have had issues with flow designer. It's nice to, to see a, a real world example. That's not just hello world, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> and it's funny, like there were definitely moments in our hackathon, like it wasn't working. Like, what do you do <gasps> in those cases where like you're not your time crunch, you, you, you're, you're, it's late at night, it's 1 a.m. in the morning and mm. it's not working as well as you want, like, it's kind of tough. You, you have to make really tough yeah. decisions on and where you spend your time. And sometimes we just, we ditch a, a functionality and we fake it and we say like, all mm -hmm. right, we're going to yep. assume this thing works 
and then move on to something else, right? That's really, really important in a hackathon is like, if something's not working the way you do, like put a, put a, like take a break from it, you know, assume that you're going to get some output from that or you're, it's going to do something and then, you know, start working on the other things. Um, yeah. You know, speaking of that, um, I think here, here are two more pro tips. I think when you are, and it's not necessarily even when you're under the gun, but when you're, when you've hit a wall or a block in what you're building, um, the two things I always do is I time box it, right? I give myself X amount of time. If I can't solve it within that time, then I know I have a problem. It's usually me in a, in a, in a miss somewhere. So a, I will get a hold of someone like I'll reach out to you or to other people that, um, I feel comfortable with, you know, <laughs> as far as my code is concerned, <laughs> I'm a very shy coder. Um, but, uh, and I'll, it's the duck principle, right? Um, where I don't have a duck, I, I, I reach out to someone and then I walk them through my code, right? I, I say, okay, this is what I'm doing. This is what it's what's supposed duck, to do. What's the duck principle? Uh, it, so the duck principle, it, and it can be a chicken too, is you have a rubber ducky and you set it on your desk and you talk to it like you're explaining to someone how your code works. And, and oh, sometimes that explain. triggers. Got it. Explain yeah. it like I'm five, yeah. right? Like... Right, right. <laughs> EL, what is that? An EL5? EL, explain like ELI5. What I, I can't remember what it is. EL5. <laughs> you, you know what's, yeah, ELI5. Uh, explain it. Yeah, ELL5. That's that's what it is. And, and then the second one, oh, great. Now I've just completely forgot. Um, well, shoot, <laughs> it's you basically know, the like, same idea. <laughs> you know, what's like really funny when I think about that is, and I'm not going to go super deep into this banter, but like the idea of like, you know, a ton of people pray, like we, we pray to, you know, uh, be, for, for religious purposes to some higher being of some yeah. sort, mm -hmm. but like, sure. that's not crazy. So millions of people do that. But if the, the thing you're praying to talks back to you, like, then you become crazy. So in your rubber ducky so, uh, scenario, you talk to a rubber ducky, <laughs> but if the rubber ducky talks back to you, like, you're, you're probably crazy. Well, so that, that just reminded me of my, of my other one is I will go for a walk. Mm. Um, it's kind of the same as the shower principle for me. When I go, like, when I wake up in the morning, I get in the shower. I think about what I'm working on or what I have to work on for the day. And sometimes I get epiphanies while I'm in the shower, I'm like, Oh, this is how I can solve this issue. It, I, yeah, I know. Yeah. No, I, but I, I, I think, I think really the root, <laughs> if the root of it is, is getting your mind disengaged from, from like, if you're sitting at the code all day long mm -hmm. and you hit that wall, if you disengage your brain from that, um, like, you know, go for a walk or whatever, mm -hmm. it, 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 it resets, you know, your thought process. And sometimes I'm not even, I'm trying to actively ignore what I'm <laughs> stuck on. And then I'll get the, you know, I'll get that epiphany yeah. or that thought on what I can do to, to, to try. Um, so those are my two uh, things, yeah. tips, that whatever you want to call them. Me of a story. <laughs> I, you know, at my old job, a coworker comes in and he's like, Dorian, like I was thinking about you in the shower. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm flattered. Like, thanks, man. Okay. He's like, no, like, I, I solved this thing, and I think you'll, yeah. you'll like, enjoy it. And so I totally get the, you know, the, the shower <laughs> concept. Yeah, so, it's it's weird. Though I will say from a meditative standpoint, um, some would argue that, like, y you should always be present in the thing that you're doing. So if you're showering, you should be thinking about showering, or washing dishes, you should be thinking about washing dishes. Though we... I think it's also okay because I I'm not always that present in those those actions that I'm doing like brushing your teeth I'm thinking about my day ready you know ready to go well like, yeah yeah and, and and the other thing is sometimes you you aren't you know it's just it just happens mm -hmm. like I'll I'll be thinking about you know soaping up and then my brain just moves on to the the stress spot the work yeah. thing that I've got yeah. and it just happens and so I I don't know being present in whatever. I guess, but I, I don't control. <laughs> I'm not it's, always it's in complete thing, control. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Wow. Talk about a side tangent. Um, is there, is there kind of, <laughs> like, 
is there any other like things you can think of? I think that's really all I, I had um, to to present um, for for the hackathon. I think once once you're done, you know, with a hackathon. Oh, a thing that I did do is um, one thing I recommend is the first thing you do in a hackathon is create a scope app. Um, mm. Essentially, uh, and if you go back to the, like a, a service now page, not that. One. And you type in App Engine. So if you're on Quebec now and you have App Engine license, um, you can click on App Engine Studio. And um, essentially, this is kind of the first screen you should start when you start on a hackathon of some sort. Is some way to create your application. Um, so you can, you know, click X on there, and I'll just walk you through it. And then you can press Create App at the top. And what's nice is they're really changing. This is very studio-like, um, but they're, they're essentially making it way easier where they're breaking it down, right? So on the left-hand side, you have this basic info. You have data, which is like your tables. You have experience, which can be like your portals, your workspaces, your mobile. Um, you have automation, which is like your flow designer. Um, and then you have security, which is like your ACLs. Um, so like this, they're really trying to make this, you know, a lot better of an experience. Um, and wow, so yeah, it's not that's... there yet uh, from where it is uh, the apps themselves. Like if you wanted to see the app that I created, um, I'll, we'll do, I guess we'll show this tidbit. If you go back to the Nano page on it, um, on the left-hand side, uh, you have SMT, SME tools, cool. Uh, type in, um, oh man, I have to like find this. Uh, <laughs> type in type in a uh, project dot list. Let's see if I can I can see it because SME tools is gonna help us here. And then contains project. Yeah, so the second one. <laughs> yeah, so this is like super hacky around, but uh, go and create a new project for yourself. Um, if, if, if you ever have Apps Engine Studio because you need it on Quebec and you're, somebody can't see it um, because somebody else created it, um, this is the way you do it. Um, so go type in your name, just say your John Merchant project. Um, yep, submit. And then click on it. And then click new under there. And then select, type in, yeah, the nano faucet name. Okay, now go back to App Engine Studio. That was totally like, the ServiceNow is gonna make that a better experience, um, but if you ever need to share your App Engine with somebody else, now it's uh, there all the shapes. Yeah. So if you can click on it, we'll just kind of show the, you know, notice there's a bunch of tables here. We talk about experience, right? Um, we talked about like automation. Um, so this is kind of like the new, you know, this and Studio will merge at some point. Um, and okay. Studio is still, you totally can still use Studio. You don't need to go here to do it, um, but it is something that you can use. The other thing that's cool about App Engine Studio is if you click on templates, um, essentially, oh, we don't, we don't have any templates, but uh, ServiceNow uh, <laughs> provides like a bunch of different templates for you depending on what you're gonna do. Like if you're gonna build you know, some portal page, they may have a template that gets you kind of started um, mm. with these are the things that you're going to need in order to build that kind of application. Um, so I, I, I envision templates are going to be huge in the future, especially if like you're recreating a very similar app um, constantly, like templates are going to, you know, make that experience a lot better. Can you, it, do you know that if you can create your own templates? Yeah. Yeah, you do. Oh, you do. nice. Yeah. So, you, so like I imagine the community, We'll, we'll build a bunch. Um, it's part of ServiceNow's like mantra is like, you know, enable developers to, you know, contribute to the platform, the whole share projects, sure. right? And, you know, oh, that's gonna come in super handy. I, I'm just thinking from, from my side in the portal world, you know, uh, the projects we end up doing a lot of times share common components, mm. you know, or common design elements. And if yeah. we can build templates to fit that, 
Oh, that'll just be. So there's two places templates exist. Exciting. And so the, this one is really on the app level, like the structure of your app gets templatized. Mm. But if you click on my apps um, and you go into nano and then you click on um, the now experience uh, nano faucet and click preview. Um, uh, what's the, where am I looking uh, here? Under experience. You should oh, see right here. The second one, yeah, click that preview button. Um, oh, this goes to the page. Uh, go back to the to studio, sorry, and click the three dots next to preview and click edit. So um, essentially what ServiceNow, when you create a new portal experience uh, and it brings up UI Builder, they have tons of templates already. Um, so if you click on that page up top where it's like page, there's a, like a drop down next to it for article page. Right, oh, right here. Yeah. These are all like templatized things that ServiceNow said, hey, if you want to create a new now experience with this, like we're going to go and, you know, create a bunch of this. Like I didn't go in and create this knowledge article layout, right? This is like an example of one that comes, you know, out of the box. Um, right. So that's another place that's going to be really nice for you, John, if like you wanted to build similar experiences, let's say across like the same company, but maybe it's different clients, like there's parent A and parent B, like mm -hmm. templates would be super awesome for you because you're like, oh yeah, like this is how their portal looks. This is how your portal is going to look, right? Um, so, you know, that, that, or like, let's say you're onboarding different parts of the organization and you're constantly building portal pages for them. Um, like let's say the finance department wants one and the HR department wants one and you want their portal to look very similar look and feel like you could create mm -hmm. templates for that um, where they have those pages. nice nice um, so that's kind of the the future of that we'll we'll, we'll do another session on uh <laughs> try to tackle knowledge or try to tackle a ui builder and see if we can defeat it <laughs> Ooh, that'll be fun <laughs> yeah. um, but cool yeah so we're right about at the hour so any yeah yeah. Any tips, my my shame shout out. If you like this, subscribe below. <laughs> you probably not made it through an hour. Some but, somewhere, right? Somewhere I don't know where to subscribe. <laughs> um, and hopefully this recorded last time. We did know that oh, last time yeah. the got corrupted, so we're hoping that this one works and the demo guys yeah. played to us. Yes, yes, yeah. hopefully so. Cool. Well, all right. Well, thank you guys for joining us. Thank you, Dorian, for this awesome walkthrough. This was great information and uh, knowing about the hackathon. So for next year, people, you should try it out um, Nothing to and lose. do something. No purchase yeah, necessary. seriously. Right? Exactly. Can, Way to go, Andrew. You can be an admin, you log into the instance, and you can try to solve a problem that frustrates you. You know, maybe at like your company, there's this like one thing in the the PPM module that like frustrates you, like go and like try to solve that problem or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so cool. Till next time. Awesome.